Hey everyone, welcome to another video. In this video, we are going to talk about a project of mine called Dash Local React Components. And this video is actually going to be a little bit different from others, because apart from focusing on this pet project itself, it's also going to be kind of a video tutorial on how to use this project. Because the project is a Python library that allows you to create custom React components for Dash applications in a more simple way. For those that don't know, Dash is a framework, it's a Python library that allows you to create rich and interactive data visualizations purely in Python. Under the hood, it creates an interactive React website for you, but you don't have to actually code any HTML, you don't have to code any JavaScript, it creates all of this lower layer of your application for you. So all you have to do is indeed focus on gathering the data and figuring out on how do you want to display it. You code the entire layout of the application in Python and then through regular Python functions, uh, you feed this data into this layout so that it's actually properly displayed. But in some rare occasions, you might also want to actually create custom React components that can be injected into those visualizations so that you can provide users with more rich experience. Those situations actually happen very rarely. So you usually will not actually have to touch JavaScript at all. But in situations when you actually uh, have something custom in mind, you might want to indeed reach out for those mechanisms as well. And those are actually also supported by the Dash framework. What I have found though is that creating custom React components with what is provided out of the box by the Dash library is not that straightforward. Hence, I created this Dash local React components library to streamline this process, especially for applications that are simpler and also potentially managed by non-technical or not strictly technical users. So for example, by data analysts uh, who might not want to deal with the entire build process of custom React applications and the custom React libraries. So here on the screen, you can see an example of an application that uses Dash local React components to indeed incorporate those custom React components into its layout. Overall, this video is going to be split into a few parts, so feel free to skip ahead. In the first part, I'm going to focus on how to build custom React components without using the Dash local React components library. So how would you do it with the regular boilerplate code? And in the second part, I'm going to focus on how to streamline this process by using this library. And in the third part of the video, I will also dive a little bit deeper into the library to explain on how does it work. Also, I hope that you will not mind a little bit of ASMR by me typing in on my mechanical keyboard during this video. So let's jump straight into it. The first thing we need to do if we want to create a React component without using the Dash local React components is to use the cookie cutter to establish our project structure. For those that don't know what the cookie cutter is, it's a software that creates project structures based on predefined templates. And for example, the cookie cutter template for the boilerplate dash react component is quite involved. It contains a lot of configuration files, build files and whatnot. And therefore it's easiest to establish such a project by using the cookie cutter template. So here we are going to run the command. Let's see if I don't make any typos. And uh, we have to provide some basic information about our component that we want to create. So I'm going to name this project example. I'm going with some of the defaults here. Uh, outer name I have to provide. And also the email address. And now we have to wait for this cookie cutter template to execute, to create all of the files. You can see that it also actually creates the virtual environment for us for Python. So all of those steps will be covered by the cookie cutter template itself. Though the process may take uh, quite some time. I think from my experience, it might be up to even 10 minutes because it downloads also of the node modules that are required by the projects. 
So indeed, this may take quite some time. So I will skip forwards for you guys and show you the final result. By the way, uh, while we are waiting for the uh, installation process to finish, what's worth noting is that I'm running this cookie cutter template on my Ubuntu instead of in the PowerShell uh, as I'm using Windows because this cookie cutter template doesn't seem to be working on Windows due to some commands missing. I never got it to work there, so I would indeed recommend to run it on Ubuntu. Though, if you create the project from a cookie cutter, you can then clone it to your Windows machine and from there it should work just fine. Cool, it seems to have finished installing. The process took around 20 minutes. Though to be fair, it's probably partially related to the fact that I'm using the Windows subsystem for Linux. Therefore, uh, the file system operations might be slower than on a regular Linux installation. So let's explore on what is actually in there. As you can see, it created our example project here. And let's explore. Let's open Visual Studio Code. Or here on the left, you can see the entire project structure that this cookie cutter template created for us. As you can see, there are a lot of files here, so it can be quite intimidating on the first look. Now, after getting used to it and uh, getting to know what each file is, it might be easier to work with those projects, but this is mainly from the perspective of experienced software developers. I wouldn't personally want to expose all of those files to, for example, data analysts who should not necessarily even care about those project structures and build processes. They mainly want to indeed focus on the actual business logic behind those applications. So the thing that you will be most interested in in this project structure is in the source directory, you have this lib for library and in the components, you have the list of components that are incorporated into this library that we are currently working on. And as you can see, it auto generated an example class, an example component for us. So this is our boilerplate structure that we can now work on. And this example component has some properties that are displayed to the users and one special property called set props. And this is something that distinguishes the dash react components from regular react components. So in dash uh, from within the component, you can change the values of the properties of a, an instance of a component. So you can notify the dash framework that the given value has changed and this uh, value will be then propagated to the callbacks of your Dash application. So let's rewrite it a little bit. So let's say that we want to create a component that has a text field and a button and whenever you click a button uh, it changes the uh, value within this text field by appending for example some uh, text to the end of this input. So we will have one property called text and this other special property called set props, which is mandatory by the dash framework and to we'll indeed deconstruct those two properties here into our variables. And we want to have an input. Fortunately, we already have an input here, which will hold our text as a value. And whenever the value of this input changes, we want to also notify the dash framework that this text property has changed. Hence, we will call this set props function. And here we, as mentioned, want to also have a button. So let's add a button. This button will have a label of click me. And whenever it's clicked, we'll append some additional text to the end of our text property. We no longer have this ID property. 
And one additional thing we have to do when creating dash components with this boilerplate template is to define all of the properties that are used within our components in this properties types list, which also defines what types are those properties of. And this will be also dynamically then validated by the dash framework whenever you assign some values to those properties. So here we have this text property, which will be a string. And we also have to add a comment here describing what this text property is. We'll just mention that it's text. Without this comment, it will also not compile because those comments are used to create annotations for the types for users later on to be able to indeed better investigate on what different properties of your custom components are. And of course, I removed this set props uh, by accident, but indeed we need this as a special function used to update the values of the properties from within the dash component. And here now, this is the component that we want to use. And let's look at the readme of this project to discover on how to actually build it. So as you can see, we have to first install our NPM dependencies. So we will go back to our console npm in install. Of course, we have to first navigate to our directory that was created for us. And here we can indeed run the npm install command to install of our dependencies. Uh, we don't necessarily have to create virtual environment because as you can see here, it is being created for us automatically by the boilerplate, by the cookie cutter template. Uh, but we have to nevertheless activate it to use it later on for the build process. So we'll go and do that. It's of course, in the bin subdirectory. And here on the left, you can see that we activated the virtual environment and we have to install the requirements with the R flag, which points to the requirements. And we will also install the requirements for the tests, which are held in a different uh, requirements txt file. Here, all of the requirements from the main file are already installed. So, and here we install this second. Oh, sorry, I forgot uh, the R flag. And here we are installing the requirements from the second file as well. And a few minutes later, we are done with this process and all the steps that we performed so far need to be executed only once when you are setting up the project. The steps that will follow now, you have to execute whenever you make any changes to your custom component. So those steps is the NPM run build, which will build our code. So it will transpile the React files into the JavaScript files, and it will bundle them together, together with some other Python code into the Python files that you can use within your project. So let's run this command. And as you can see, this running this command is also not instant. So it also requires some time to build our projects. So iterating over your project may not be super smooth, but nevertheless, it will allow you to iteratively make changes to your files. And so, as you can see, uh, the build was successful. And here on the other step, we can test our changes. In this step, we'll be using our custom example component in a test environment. So this is not going to be our final application, but something that we can use as a playground to see if our component actually works. And this is incorporated into this usage.py file at the root of our project. As you can see, this example, this usage.py is actually a very simple dash application that uses our example component that we created. And of course, currently it is using still the old properties that were there with the boilerplate. So we'll test it. As you can see, it actually suggests all of the properties that we added. So in this case, this is the text property because based on the annotation that we created, this build process actually generates the Python code that also has 
additional information about the properties that are available for those custom components, which makes them extremely useful if you want to share your library with others instead of using it just internally within your project. So here we we'll assign a value of test to our text property and we'll remove the label because it's no longer part of this component. We'll also remove this additional element and the callback that is no longer needed, at least for our example here. And we will see how this component actually works by running this example. And as readme says, to run it, we just have to execute the usage.py with Python and it should open the application on the usual port of 8050, which is a usual port for Dash applications. And you can also see this port in here. So let's open our application. And here we can see it. There is this value of test. I can modify it. And whenever I click the button, it adds an A at the end of the text within the input. And as this is a Dash application, we can also add callbacks that interact with all of the properties of this component as if that was actually just a regular component you would import from the standard Dash library. And as mentioned before, if we now want to make any change to our component, so for example, instead of appending A to the end of our component, we want to append the B letter, we have to go back to our terminal. We have to stop our application. We have to reboot the, the project so that all of the Python files are regenerated based on the changes we've made to our JavaScript. And then we can start the application again to re-evaluate if our changes are actually correct. And now just validating the result, we can run the application again. And here in the browser, we can see that once it starts, now if I click the click me button, it appends bis at the end of our example text. Unfortunately, this is not the end of the story because if we now want to use this custom component within our Dash application, so not within this example project that we created for the component itself, we have to still create a Python package based on the code that we wrote so far. And uh, to do this, once again, following the readme of the component that we created, we have to run those commands. So once again, we have to build our project. We already did this after making the last changes. Then we have to create the Python distribution by running this command. And if we go now to the project structure, we should see in the distribution that our new example component in version of 001 was created for us. Now we can install this package from our main Dash project, or we can upload it, for example, into the pip repository and then install it from the online resources. So let's create a local Dash application now so that we can test if this component can indeed be properly imported. Uh, so here we'll just go and create Dash app, which will be our example application. And let's actually explore on what should we create in there. So Dash app. This is currently an empty project. We'll create first of all the requirements for our application. And secondly, we'll create our main file, main.py. And in practice, for this uh, simple example, we just want to use the same Dash application as we used for our usage.py. So we can just indeed test our example component. But in practice, you can imagine how you would have different components located in different libraries, and then this single application in the central point, importing all of them into a single project, and then indeed merging them together into a single layout.
of course we have to in our requirement add dash now what we need to do is to create the virtual environment for our application so we go with python vnf command and once the virtual environment is ready we first of all have to activate it and please note that the command for activating virtual environments on windows is different than activating them on linux uh, so this is something to keep in mind and what we need to do now once our virtual environment is activated is to install all of the dependencies that are needed by our project and those are the dependencies both listed in the requirements files in our case this is just the dash framework and also this library that we generated locally for this example dash component. So we will do a pip install from the requirements file. It should take uh, just a moment. And now let's go and install the other dependency that we created a moment ago. as you can see it has installed successfully so we should be able to actually run our application using the python command on our main.py file and refreshing the page we can indeed see that the dash application is running properly and our button so our interactions within the component also work properly and we can also create a custom callback within our application just to see uh, that it indeed behaves just as a regular dash component Let's rerun our application. And if I didn't make any typos, we should now see this text equal test, which gets updated both whenever I insert a new text into the input field. And also whenever I click this button, even though we didn't code any interactions like this on the Python side. All those interactions are defined within our custom React component. The problem now is that whenever we want to make any change to our React component, we have to once again open our example project, go into this example React.js file, make changes to our project, and once again rebuild it, re-export it as a Python package, and install it again within our target project in order to indeed make use of our updates. This process overall may be quite involving, and hence that's when the dash local React components library comes in. So instead indeed of using this example boilerplate project, we can define our React components natively within the structure of our target application. So in order to do this, we don't need to use the cookie cutter template. We'll just create a new folder called React. We can call this project however we want to. And within this folder, we'll create our example component instead and this component will be a javascript file and
and it will contain the same body as the previous component that we implemented with one unfortunate difference. Unfortunately, the dash local react components does not support the JSX format, the format that allows you to create tags directly within your JavaScript. So this is overall not a native thing that you can use in JavaScript files. This is something that is provided through a translation. So web browsers don't know what this div actually means within the JavaScript. So before it can be sent to the web browsers, this code has to be transpiled. And as the dash local react components do not support the transpilation step, we have to actually transpile it ourselves. So in order to do this, we'll import react. and use react create element function that it provides. This function uh, accepts three or more arguments. The first argument is the type of the element that we want to create. So in our case, first of all, it's a div. Second argument is the list of parameters that this element has. As we can see, this div element does not have any parameters. And after this comes the list of child elements that are nested within it. So in our case, it will be once again, a next element of type input. So we can type in input. Uh, it has two parameters. So first of them is the value. And the value is equal to the text. And second parameter of this element is on change. And this is equal to this lambda function. And we have to repeat the same process for creating the element for our button. And now that our component is ready, we need to add the dash local react components to our dependencies of the project and of course install it. With this dependency installed, we can now import the function that allows us to load the components from this React directory directly into our Python code. So first of all, we no longer need this example component that we loaded before. And instead, we'll import from the dash local React component a function called load React component. And we can use this function now to import this example component that we created. We'll call it example. And as a parameters here, we have to provide first of all the application that this will be imported for. So we have to pass in the dash object. Secondly, we have to specify from which folder we want to import this component. So we call this folder as react and now we have to specify from which file within this folder we want to import a component as within this file we are exporting this component as a default export we don't have to specify what name does this component have otherwise we would have to do this as the fourth parameter of this invocation but as we do actually export it as a default one we do not have to actually do this and here this example component is now loaded, so we should be able to incorporate it into our layout in this way. 
let's start our application. We do not need to now rebuild anything. We don't need to reinstall anything. It should just run as is. Let's reload our application. And of course we got an error, cannot read properties of undefined reading props. Let's see what mistake did I make in our example project. Of course, here we are currently using the function notation for creating components. So instead of using these props, we'll accept it as a parameter of our function. And as I made this mistake, I actually don't need to even restart the application from the terminal. All I need to do is to refresh the application in the browser because it will reload all of the JavaScript files that it requires. And hence our application should just work from the get go. And as you can see, it behaves just as before with our boilerplate example component, but with much less code that was needed to actually spin up this example. So by using the dash local react component, what we essentially need is what's present in this folder. So within this target application, and we actually don't need anything from here that was defined by the boilerplate template for dash react components. Of course, the major drawback of this approach is that it does not support JSX files. So you have to actually create your components using the regular JavaScript notation. But if you really want to create something in JSX, you can also create a custom build process for your application that will automatically transpile those JSX files into JavaScript files using something like Bubble, for example. But for those simple applications that don't have any build process incorporated into them, it's easier to use this notation instead. But just for completeness, let's see how would that actually work. So let's create this new example. Let's call it new example. And let's indeed create a JavaScript file instead. And let's modify our example so that it actually uses this JSX notation. Uh, we can actually copy over the code from the previous file, from the previous library and paste it in here. So it should behave in the same way as our previous component. And now from the terminal, we can use a command to transpile this file into a JavaScript notation. Of course, we need to install first required bubble transpilers. So let me do that quickly. And with this, our transpilation process should succeed. And if we look into our project files, we can see that it created this new example file for us, which is automatically transpiled by Bubble and we can indeed import it the same way as before into our project. And by running the application, we should still see that it behaves the same as before. But this additional step should be only required indeed in cases where projects and components are bigger than usual. And in those cases, I would also always consider just using this boilerplate template provided by Dash, because nevertheless, if you need to have a build process for application, you may also just go for this more elaborate approach. And now for people who are interested in this, few words on how this project actually works. So under the hood, it's a very simple Python library that indeed exposes this single function called load react component. And this function simply registers a public endpoint that serves all of the files listed within the folder that was mentioned as the root folder of react components. And on top of it, it generates a 
dash component object that wraps the React component that you are trying to import. What's important here, those dash components need to be registered not on the Python side, so the place from which you are invoking the creation of those elements, but on the React side, so the side that is actually rendering those components. Hence, there is some logic within the library to make sure that those components are loaded before the first time of them needing to be rendered on the screen. And also, it creates a external scripts mapping so that the website knows where the files the given components might depend on are actually located within the system because it's not necessarily limited to you creating dash components that are localized to just one javascript file you can have multiple of those files that depend on each other by importing uh, each other and hence this application also need to be able to discover those files in order to load them and load them in a proper order and only once all of those files are present it will invoke the rendering process of the dash application so that all of those custom components can be incorporated into your layout of the final application this library also ensures that whenever you are importing multiple different components from the same directory that any work is not duplicated, so no resources are duplicated when the website is actually loaded, but those resources are loaded only once when needed. And for some more complicated examples, so this is the page that I showed you at the beginning of this video. It has one, two, three, four, five, six custom React components. And as you can see, in order to minimize the boilerplate within those files, associated with creating uh, React elements. I assigned the function of uh, react.createElement to the dollar sign so that the actual notation here of creating those custom elements within the component is much shorter. And you can see that I use it in all of the custom elements within this project. For more information on how to write Dash components, I very much recommend you going both to the documentation of the Dash local React components library and also familiarizing yourself with the documentation of the Dash itself, especially the project called Dash component boilerplate, which is the boilerplate template that I used for the cookie cutter invocation in order to create my example project. Yeah, that would be it for this video. Uh, I hope you found it informative. If there are any questions regarding creation of custom React components or importing them using the Dash local React components library, please feel free to reach out to me. I will be happy to help you out. And of course, I also recommend you going through the documentation and read me of the Dash local React components library, as well as the documentation of the Dash framework itself, because you should find a lot of useful resources on how to write more complex React components for Dash applications. So thank you for watching and see ya in the next one.